Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, Jesus.
Jesus, I praise you. Sing a simple song of love for my Savior to my Jesus. I'm grateful for all the things you've done, my precious Savior. Loving Jesus My heart is grateful That you call me your own But there's no place I'd rather be Than in your arms of love Savior, to my Savior, to my Jesus, to my Jesus, I'm grateful for the things you've done, I'm grateful for the things you've done, my loving Savior, oh precious Jesus, my heart is glad. That you call me your own, but there's no place I'd rather be than in your arms of love. In your arms of love, holding me still. simple song. I sing a simple song of love to my Savior, to my Savior, precious Jesus, precious Jesus. Grateful for the things you've done. I'm grateful for
to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you Cause better is one day
was desperate to see you If you're looking for somebody Who knows there's nothing without you Look this way, Jesus Look this way, Jesus Look this way, Jesus Oh, look on us with your favor on you, Lord. I can't even express with words how I feel. Just hear my spirit, Lord. It groans, it groans, it groans, it groans. If everybody says we're crazy If everybody says we've gone too far You have stricken us with your passion, Lord How can we relent from you? can we draw back from you, oh Lord? Where could we go? How will we make it? Where will we go? The promise of your glory pushes us forward. church Jesus we love your body Father lead us on lead us on further into you Jesus further into you Lord and take this whole world Don't take your presence, take this whole world. But don't take your spirit, take this whole world. But 
Don't take this hunger away, take this over. And we will pursue you, Jesus. Go after your presence. We'll run for you like water in the desert. We'll run for you like hope in a hopeless land. Some of you in this place tonight, you're kind of like me. You sort of feel like a misfit. Some years ago, the Lord just touched us with such a higher thing. It doesn't make us better than anyone else. Sometimes it makes us more wretched than anyone else because we feel like if we don't have the touch of the Lord, if we don't have his pleasure, if we don't have his eye, then we can't go on. Years ago, I was happy just to be in church. Now church doesn't meet the need anymore. Years ago, I was happy just to play the piano and lead the choir. But a, a great song just doesn't meet the need anymore. And you're here tonight because there's something inside of you that just can't be met by all the stuff in your life. You've come to Brownsville because you've heard that God shows up here. But Jesus, Jesus, the joy of you, Lord, is the pursuit of you. The excitement in life, Lord, is just the very thought of you. That's why I, I'm desperate, I'm desperate for you. And I don't want to ever get used to chasing you, Lord. Take us down a new path, Lord. And we will pursue you, Lord. Take us out of our comfort zone. Oh, but don't take your presence from us, Lord. I'm desperate for you. <laughs> Come on, sing them from your spirit to the Lord. And I, I'm lost without you. And my heart. For you, and my heart burns for you, and my heart 
But lift your voice and praise him. Go ahead. He's here. He's here. Just praise him.
feel like the Lord's trying to move in here tonight and we want to let him move. That's more important than anything else in this whole service. Just let God have his way. Go ahead, let him have his way. Jesus, 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 Jesus. We won't let go, Lord, no. We won't let go. We're gonna hold on, Jesus. We're gonna hold on, Jesus. Do we see you again? Do we touch you again? We won't let go. For we are sick with love, Jesus. We are sick with love. Mm Paint for you, Jesus. We pant after you, Lord. We pant after you, Lord. We pant after you, Lord Jesus. want to see you, Lord. We want to see your face. We've come too far to go back. We've crossed the line. 
we're not satisfied with with yesterday it's gone today we're in need could you tell him tonight tell him you want to go deeper just standing on the outside looking in Lord I want to see your smile and know it's there because I'm pleasing you place where it can just be me and you close Lord I'm gonna find your heart and lose myself in you where it can just be me and you close Lord I want to find your heart and lose myself in you Sing with me. Lord, I want to touch your heart. Lord, I want to touch your heart. No longer standing on the outside looking in. Lord, I want to see your smile. Lord, I want to see your smile. And know it's there because I'm pleasing you. Know it's there because I'm pleasing you. Lord, I want to touch your heart. Lord, I want to touch your heart. No longer standing on the outside. Longer standing on the outside looking in. I want to see your smile. 
Lord, I want to see your smile. I know it's there because I'm pleasing you. Deeper, Lord. Deeper, Lord, to the place where it can just be me and you. Closer, Lord, I want to find your heart. Closer, Lord, I want to find your heart and lose myself in you deeper 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 lord to the place where it can just be me and you closer lord want to find your heart Closer, Lord. Want to find your heart. Want to find your and lose, lose myself in you. Deeper, Lord. Closer, Lord. Deeper, Lord. Please draw me closer to you. Deeper, Lord, closer, Lord, deeper, Lord, please draw me closer. Deeper, Lord, closer, Lord, deeper, Lord, please draw me closer to you. Deeper, Lord, closer, Lord, deeper, Lord, please draw me closer, deeper. Deeper, Lord, closer, Lord, deeper, Lord, please draw me closer to you. Deeper, Lord, closer, Lord, deeper, Lord, please draw me closer. Deeper. Just be me and you. Closer. Want to find your heart. Lose myself in you. Closer, Lord. I want to find your heart 
I lose myself in you. Deeper, 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 Lord, to the place where it can just be me and you. Closer, 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 Lord. Gonna find your heart and lose myself in you.
your hands and tell them, Jesus, we can't do nothing. We can't do nothing. We can't do nothing till you come. Nothing at all. Jesus, tell you, you need another touch from your Lord, tell you, we're hungering and we're thirsting after righteousness, we haven't had enough, Lord, we gotta have you, we gotta come, Lord.
of the harvest you're not done with this Lord you're just getting started Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. There's something that God does with us. I'll go. No, just stay right there. Can't do nothing. In the world, they have a paradigm that tells us that when we are learning how to become something, we have to go through certain stages. And, and they call those four stages forming, storming, norming, and performing. In the forming stage, you don't know you don't know. And... Uh, and you're called unconscious incompetence. It's like getting excited about becoming a, a parent for the first time. And those who have children look on you with pity because they know you don't know. They know you don't know you don't know, no matter how many books you've read. It's like sitting among the guys telling them what your wife is going to do after you get married. And they look on you with pity. Because they know you don't know, you don't know. It's like telling the Lord you want to become a man or woman of prayer. just because you listen to the Larry Lee series. And you say, I'm going to start this week and I'm going to give my life to prayer. And those who have given their lives to prayer listen to you and they realize that you don't know that you don't know. 
you're an unconscious incompetent. And then you have the baby. And you get married. And you begin to pray. And then you become a conscious incompetent. Now you know you don't know. Dr. Spock doesn't have it all together about those babies. They know when they're hungry and they know when they want to get up and they know when they're going to determine who's going to manage the house. And, um, and they have a will. But if you stay with it, if you press on through the difficulties that are going on with it, uh, when I bought a computer, a guy told me, he said, Reverend, this is going to change your life. And I said, I'm looking for something to change my life. And, and I, I got really excited about the forming stage of joining in that relationship with that computer. And, um, but after I had it for a while, and I, I went into the storming stage, I found out why they called that little blinking light a cursor. <laughs> and some people quit right there, but I, I had just invested too much money in the computer to quit, and so I went on and finally figured out that sometimes the printer doesn't work because you don't have it turned on. Or sometimes it doesn't work because you don't have it plugged in or because you haven't selected it. And when you get normal with computers, people who don't know anything about computers think you're a computer guru, but you're just normal. Now, when you're normal, you just know that you know. That's the norming stage. But you haven't really succeeded, they tell us, until you come to the stage in which you are a performer. And in the performing stage, you're an unconscious competent. You don't know you know. Peter didn't know his shadow was healing people. If he had given thought to it, if he had seen it take place, it probably would have stopped. But he didn't know. And there are things in God that we have, we have received. And, and some of you can look back and remember the, the storming stage, the forming stage. You, you can remember the day when, when Pastor John's legs buckled. And there was, there was holy chaos in that moment. And strange stuff took place. But if you hung around for a while, it ceased to be strange. It just got to be normal. Normal. And people who, who came around you and they would look at folks who just shook their heads all night long, they said, is that normal? Well, outside of here, it might not be normal. But inside, it's normal. But you have to learn how to see it. And then when you got to the place that you could see it and you, th you threw your music lists away and you stopped getting all the keys right and all the songs right. Does this one segue into this just right? And what about this? And can we play this? Are we okay with this? And you begin to understand what it means to be an unconscious competent. You don't know, you, you know. I don't think, I don't think Lindell has the slightest idea of what God does through him. And I think it's, if you, if you think about what God does in your life, it would stop. How am I doing this? The bumblebee, according to those who study that stuff aerodynamically, say it shouldn't fly, but nobody has told him. 
And so he's, he's still doing it. His body's too big. It's too heavy for his wingspan, but he doesn't know. He's an unconscious competent. There are people who are wonderful in what they do until somebody starts assessing it and analyzing it and breaking it down. And all of a sudden, they, they can't do what they did anymore because now they, they think about it. Now, here's the challenge that that this church is facing along with other churches in the body of Christ, but particularly this church. Because you've come through a season in which you have learned some of the ways of God. And our problem so often is that when we learn some of God's ways, we think we have learned all of God's ways. you go to the river you can you can put your pan in and pull out gold nuggets that are washing down from somewhere but at some point somebody says you know there's got to be a source for where this stuff is coming from and so they go to the source and and they go they go into the cave and and they say my god but pretty soon if you stay right there you're going to get all that there is and if you want to get more you got to go deeper. The only problem with going deeper is that if people can't see you down by the river, they sure aren't going to see you in the cave. What are you doing in there? I'm looking for stuff that I can't find out here anymore. Somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to go and, and say, Lord, I know there's more. I know there's more. And the thing that will draw you to the more is to develop an acute sense of hunger for the living God. And it's a decision. It's a way of life. It's not saying, well, I'm okay today. But it's today you wake up and you say, I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry for you. I need your touch. I seek your face. I need your presence. You say, what well, well, didn't you eat yesterday? Yeah, but that was yesterday. Today I I need something else. And periodically God will come and He will say, I need somebody to come into this fearful place where this mountain is on fire, where the ground around it is shaking. When the psalmist spoke about it, he said, what ails you? Mountains that leaped like calves and lambs. He says, what in the world is wrong with you? God came down. God came down on the mountain. And he gave the command that if even an animal touches it, it must be stoned to death. The writer of Hebrews says, and so fearful was the sight that Moses, the man of God, said, I myself am exceedingly fearful and afraid. And then in all of that, God comes and he meets with the elders on the mountain. And the scripture says they saw the God of Israel and they didn't die. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against them. They saw God and they ate and drank. They all saw God. What a revelation. What an incredible experience to be able to see God to break bread together, eating and drinking on the mountain, and God's just sharing with them. And then the Bible says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain. Stay there. God, wasn't I already with you? Yes, you were. But I'm inviting you into a, a deeper place. 
Moses arose with Joshua's servant, and Moses went up to the mountain. But to the elders he said, Wait here for us until we return to you. Moses went up to the mountains, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the Lord covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us how Moses was feeling outside the cloud. He was afraid. He was trembling. He was fearful. And those who were at the foot of the mountain, it looked like the whole mountain was on fire. The whole thing. And they can't see Moses because the cloud is covering it. The fire of God is on it. Joshua can see him. Moses, yes, come here. We were in Africa last fall, and this incredible servant of the Lord, this man of God, he said to us these words, and I've shared it with uh, Pastor Kilpatrick. He said, Americans want to colonialize the Holy Ghost. He said, but the Holy Spirit must be raw. Raw. You can't colonize him. You, you can't tame Aslan. Aslan's not a tame lion. Our God is not a tame God. The Holy Spirit is God. You can't put him in a box. You can't say service is going to be over and 45 minutes. You say to him, how long is service going to last? He's not interested in sensitive seekers. <laughs> Who are willing to spend three hours at a football game. And 45 minutes in the house of God. This, this pastor prayed over some handkerchiefs for us and that we wanted to take back home. We saw so many miraculous things taking place. We just said, we got to carry some of this back. And so I went down to the little store and I bought a whole three dozen of them. And I gave them to him. And I said, would you pray over these? He said, sure. And he walked out of the room. And about 20 minutes later, he came back and he had this, this thing in his hand full of the handkerchiefs and he had prayed over them and anointed them and they were smelling great and uh, and I said did you pray over them and he said yes and he looked at my wife and he said here take one and she she took one pulled it out of the package and as soon as she did she fell in the floor just I I mean she didn't move not a muscle she nothing twitched and and he just stood there like it was normal stuff you know we were talking and he was telling me how glad he was that we were there and so forth. And, and then I looked at my watch and I realized that we had to go to the airport. And so he looked at me and he said, if you don't take that out of her hand, she's going to be there all night. <laughs> well, you know what went through my mind. <laughs> if she hit the ground when she took it, What's going to make me stay up right when I took it out of her hand? And I took it out of her hand with fear and trembling. I mean, I, it wasn't like I was afraid to fall. And I wasn't even all that concerned about whether I was going to miss my plane. But there are moments in our lives when, when there is just something more that God wants to do for us and to us and with us that challenges our, our rational understanding. And there are, there are many of you here who have seen God do some awesome and incredible things. And the testimonies that have come from this place all over the world. Where did you hear that? Where did you see? In Brownsville. What? Yes, Brownsville. The question isn't, can he do it again? The question is, why limit him? 
Moses. Yes, sir. He says, you remember how your rod turned to a snake? Yes, sir. And how your hand turned to leprosy? Yes, I, I sure remember that. And he says, you remember how when you stretched the rod out over the waters, they open? Yes. You remember when, when you stretched out the rod in the sea and the, the rivers of Egypt turned to blood? Yes. And gnats and boils and frogs and all that? Yeah. He says, I remember. He says, you remember how you took the tree and threw it in the water and it, the water became sweet? He says, oh, yes, I remember that. He says, I want to show you something else. Okay. Come into the mountain. Come up on the mountain. Come into the cloud into the dark place, into the place where people can't see. Minds aren't lit from the outside. And if you're looking for the precious stones, the real good ones, they're not rolling around in the river. I'm a river person, but there are things that we're trying to find in the river that you can't find in the river. There are treasures that God will only give you in dark places. And man, do we know how to avoid the dark places. We, in fact, we rebuke them. We bind them. We plead the blood over them. We cast them out. We resist them in the name of Jesus. And the Lord says, yeah, I know you think you're resisting, but it ain't going to happen. So Moses walks into the cloud. Seven days waiting for an invitation. Waiting, you think maybe waiting until he's satisfied. You know, if I got this close and he hasn't killed me. Maybe it's going to be okay. Moses, yes. Come on in. How I many you know God will wait until you're ready? How I many know God will work you over until you're ready? Lord, I'm not ready. He said, I can help you with that. <laughs> so he starts working on us. And when he gets done, I say, God, I am ready for anything you want to do. I don't, have you, did you ever see the movie Field of Dreams? In the movie Field of Dreams, there's this, there's this dividing line between what they know and what they don't know. And the dividing line is a cornfield. And people come out of the cornfield and they go back and people on the outside say, what's in there? They say, you got to come in to see. And James Earl Jones is, is the guy who, who's been searching and looking for a lot of things. And so you see James Earl walk up to the cornfield and he puts his, he won't go in, he just puts his hand in. When he puts his hand in, it disappears. So he pulls it back again. And he says, in his classic, inimitable style. <laughs> and he looks back, he says, <laughs> and he looks at his friends, and he says, I don't have anything to lose by going through here. I know what's outside. What I don't know is what's deeper, Lord. To the place where it can just be me and you. Closer, Lord, I'm going to find your heart and lose myself in you. The place where it can just be me and you. Mm -hmm. Close the Lord. I want 
want to find your heart and lose myself in you. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares are past, home at last. Never to rejoice. Oh, I want to see you just to look upon your face. There to sing forever of your saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. My cares are pet, and I'm home at last, ever to. We used to sing that about heaven until we got in revival. And we, th we, we started thinking, you know, these songs were written by people in revival, about revival, and people outside of revival thought they were talking about heaven. But there's something that God wants to show us now. And the way to get there is to make a decision. I'm past caring about what people think. I'm past caring what people say. It's all irrelevant. There's just one thing that I'm looking for. And I'm looking for his face. I want to I want to find his face. When my brother said, if there's anybody you're looking for, Lord, who's desperate and who's messed up and who's all he's just I'm I'm a candidate, but he didn't know that I was ahead of him in the line. There's something that, that, that God has for us the day we say to him, I didn't get it all yesterday. And no matter how good it was, the scripture says he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And all you got to do is say, more. Ever to rejoice, and you just open your heart and you say, Oh, I want to see you to look upon your face, there to sing forever. glory just let me lift my voice my cares say it again my cares are past say it my cares my cares are past and I'm home at last ever to Now, you don't realize it. You got to the first level. You got to the first place in God when you came to the place that you could say, we don't know what we are doing. We don't have a clue you are here, and we thought it was going to be this way, and it's this way, and if you don't help us, we're not going to make it. You just have to start all over again and say, my cares are past. Oh, 
So Moses goes into the mountain, and God just talks to him. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he's there. Doesn't need any food, doesn't need any water. God talks to him, tells him how to raise an offering, tells him how to build a building, and tells him how to get it. And the Bible says that when he came out of the mountain, his face was shining. He not only glowed in the dark, he glowed in the daytime. I want you to look at somebody and say, it's time to go to another level of glory. Tell somebody else, it's time to go to another level of glory. It's time to go to another level of glory. It's time to go to another level of glory. Oh, it's time to go to another level of glory. Somebody say, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go to another level of glory. Ready to go. This is the truth. This, this is really the truth. That God will come in the season and what was mysterious yesterday, you master today. But whenever God sees us mastering the mystery, he changes the rules. And you're going along thinking that you know all the rules, every, the way it's always gone, and suddenly, yesterday's rules don't work today. That's because it's time to go to a, another level. And the way you go to the next level is that you go back through the storm. Because in the storm, God can pull some things out that won't come out when the sea is calm. Do you remember Matthew and Mark both say it, that when Mary anointed Jesus with that incredibly lavish offering, that sacrifice, when she did what she did, and Judas said, why this waste? And Jesus said, leave her alone the next verse after that story is this it says and judas went out you you don't have to go on a searching party looking for judas just get extreme in your worship just get crazy in your passion for god and judas types will say that's more church than i want and God has to flush them out in the storm so when he begins to form the new team, he's got a whole different constituency to go. 
It's not the same. It's bigger, it's richer, it's more glorious than it was the last time. And, and we will say, do you think God could do it? God says, don't you go there. Don't, don't go there. Just come on into the cloud. Come into the cloud. Join the hand of somebody standing next to you for a moment. The psalmist said that those who create idols put a lot of time and energy into them. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have throats, but they can't speak. Hands, but they can't touch. And feet, but they can't move. And then he makes this incredible statement. He says, and everyone who makes them will become like them. If you make an idol, you'll become like the idol. An idol takes a lot of work. You go without food, you go without provision, you go without resources. It takes a lot of your time, it takes a lot of your money. It takes more time to build an idol and to serve an idol than it does to serve God. And when they make it, they don't just make it, but after it's formed, they take gold and silver and they put it on it and they look at it for a moment and say, it needs another coat and it needs another coat. And they just keep investing in it until all that they are and all that they have is in that idol and it becomes such a treasured thing, they have to. They have to acknowledge its existence. We've been worshiping God since I've been here, coming here, I told Pastor John, I said, I've been carrying stuff back home. And a prophetic word came to us in January because you've set your heart to study revival and what God is doing in the earth. He says, I'm bringing it to your church. And since last January, we have been in a passionate pursuit of God. Worship at 10. We said 10 to 12, but sometimes it goes to 1.30. Just in the face of God. We come back at night. We have a Sunday night service now. We call it worship on steroids. had a friend who bought a Corvette and he so admired that Corvette that he had a skilled craftsman put 10 coats of lacquer on it. And the Lord brought that picture back to my mind one morning as we were before him. He said, every time you come here, you put another coat on. Come back at night, put another coat on. If making an idol will make you like the idol, what happens when you make room for God? If, it, if holding up a place and setting it apart for an inanimate object that can't deliver you from anything, if you will become like that, what happens if you keep visiting the Holy of Holies and increasing what the throne looks like because your worship builds the throne. It keeps causing it to grow. And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, Moses was changed in my presence. And he said, and so you too 
will be changed into my image from glory to glory. From glory to glory. Close your eyes. Change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Come on, pray it. Change me into your image, Lord. Into your likeness, Lord, change me, change me, change me, change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Change me into your image, Lord. Into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Change me, change me, change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord, change me. I want to be like you. Be like you, oh Lord, change me. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Be like you, oh Change me, change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Let go and lift your hands. Change me, change me, change me. Into your image, Lord, into your likeness, change me. I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Be like you, oh Lord. Change me. Tell them I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Be like you. Oh, no. Change me. Come on, pray it out to him. Sing it out to him. Change me, change me. Into your image, Lord, 
into your likeness, Lord. Change me, change me, change me, change me into your image, Lord, into your likeness, Lord. Change me. Come on, cry out to him. I want to be. I want to be like you. Be like you. Oh, Lord. Change me. Change me. I want to be like you. I want to be. I want to be like you, oh Lord, change me, change me, I want to be like you, want to be like you, I want to be Let it rain, let it rain, let the fire of your spirit rain, let it of your spirit rain let it rain let it rain let the fire of your spirit rain Spirit, rain. I need you to hear this, Pastor John. Sunday night, I was I was driving home. I was looking for you, and uh, don't say you need to stand right here because standing is the best way to make a commitment. It's the best way to fight, incidentally, unless you're God. <laughs> but we've been hearing rain sounds in Pittsburgh. We've been seeing rain visions. And, uh, and some people think we have been wasting time pursuing God as we have and periodically I'll think God you know we are spending a lot of time doing this and uh, and I, I said to the staff J just consider that right now that you're just getting paid to pray and um, so there's some things that aren't getting done 
but it's not many more than the things that weren't getting done when they were working eight hours a day. So it's not like we've lost a whole lot, you know. It's, somebody said work has the propensity to fill up the time allotted for it. So the, I said, Lord, our, I said, is this, what, what is this? And he reminded me of Mary, and he said, what did they say about Mary's offering? And they said it was equivalent to a year's wage. He said, what would a year's wage of your time and the rest of the people look like if you gave that time to me? He said, don't begrudge this. And the phrase came back to me, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. That there is a, there is something best, I guess maybe critical mass is the right word, but it's the minimum amount necessary to create and sustain a nuclear reaction. And I was listening to a message, and in fact, it was when I had preached, and so I was just listening to it because I had notes. I didn't have any notes for it, never preached it before, and so I said, man, I'm going to figure this out. And so I was talking about Mary, and I began to say something. I said, you know, the fragrance that filled the room isn't like the wind that filled the house. And it was, it was like a thunderclap in my spirit. And I just screamed, I was driving my car, I screamed out, my neighbor said he heard me. And I said, oh God, when the room is filled with the fragrance of the perfume, we'll hear the sound of the wind. It will fill the house. That this season that you're in is it's not a season that you can look at and say, are we doing anything? This, this time that you're giving to worship and to intimate intercession, the songs that you're singing, they're not manly songs. I don't know if you've noticed. In fact, your songs that make manly guys uncomfortable. You know, just put your arms around me, Jesus. And what were you saying about it? Just putting your head on him. And, but that's what he's calling for. He's calling for more Johns who will come and lay their head on Jesus' breast. He's calling for a church of apostles who, when they see John with his head on Jesus' breast, they won't think, what's up with that? But they'll say, that's the disciple whom Jesus loves. And when Jesus says things that all the rest of them don't know, he just makes a comment, for instance, one of you is going to betray me. And all of them begin to ask. All of them. Is it I? Lord, is it me? And there were two who didn't have to ask. John didn't have to ask. He knew it wasn't him. You can't betray somebody when you spend this kind of time in their arms. He's just there. But the rest have to ask because they don't, they don't know. Judas doesn't ask. He knows. And then Peter doesn't say to the Lord, who is it? He says to John, who's right here, he says, John, ask him, who is it? <laughs> Why ask John? Why don't you ask yourself? Because when you're this close, mm -hmm. Lord, I want to touch your heart. No longer standing on the outside looking in. See, he touches his heart. And he hears, he hears revelation and truth that none of the other guys hear. 
And he just, he doesn't take his head off. He just leans back in his arms and says, who is it? This is the one who's putting his hand in the dish with me right now. That's the one. Would it be worth getting closer and filling this room with the fragrance of worship until it can't stand it? Until the very walls say, we can't take any more. And at the moment of critical mass, the Lord says, I can't take any more either. I'm coming. And he comes in a whole fresh, new, and different way. No less powerful, no less real. He's coming. He's coming. They didn't understand it when you moved into prophetic worship and prophetic intercession. It's, it's not normal church stuff. But he says, I'm coming. I'm waiting for the moment of critical mass. He's saying, I flushed out something in the storm. I did some pruning because I've got a bigger harvest coming. All I did was make room for what I have coming. And he is saying to us, enlarge the place of your habitation. Enlarge. Don't cut back, cut up. Break out, stretch out, move out, dispossess the enemy. Begin to send a sound in this place that will not only cause the walls to shake, but the very city to shake. It's no accident that you have the kind of visitation in this city this week. They could have gone anywhere. There are a lot of places that are more chic and sophisticated than Pensacola, Florida. But God sent some broken people here. And you don't need to fear them. Just keep worshiping. And just simply say, Father, we crossed the line. You remember when you crossed the line a few years ago? Cross it again. Just cross. You know how Mary crossed the line? She stood in a moment in her, her life and just said, God, I don't have anything of value if I can't use it to worship you. Would you pray with me? Father, in this place where you have moved with such incredible power and incredible strength, when you have moved in such an awesome sense of your presence and your holiness in this place, in this place where babies were born by the thousands into the kingdom of God, We hear the sound of infants. We hear the sound of lullaby. We hear singing in the nursery. We see children playing in the streets. We see little lambs leaping about. It's your doing, Lord, and it's marvelous. Oh, would you come? Would you come? Would you come? We invite you. We welcome you. We step across the line one more time. We have mastered the mystery of yesterday. Lord, we're ready for a new adventure.
We're ready for a new mystery. I want you to do this. I want you to take a physical step. Just whatever you have to do, just take a physical step and let that step be a prophetic step for you that says, mark the day I stepped across on the 25th of May. I stepped into a new place on the 25th of May. Now listen, when Moses went into the dark cloud, he said to all of the elders, you wait here. I alone will go in. Today he's saying, everybody go in. Would you say to Pastor John, would you say to the leaders of this church, go on in. We're going with you. We want to see what's on the other side of that mystery. If we have to lose ourselves to find ourselves, give it up. Give it up for him. Now say it one more time. Deeper, Lord. Deeper, Lord, to the place where it can just be me and you. Closer, Lord. Want to find your heart. Want to find your heart. I lose myself in you. Deeper, Lord, to the place where it can just be me and you closer closer lord gonna find your heart and lose myself in you Tell him, Lord, I want to touch your heart. Lord, I want to touch your heart. Sing for the church. No longer standing on the outside looking in. Lord, I want to see your smile. And know it's there because I'm pleasing you. Lord, this is a transforming moment. It's a place of transition. It's a place of change. But you brought us to this place for just such a time as this. And in this place, we're opening our eyes and we're saying, God, you have so much more. And we don't want to come to heaven without realizing all that you intended for us to have. Uh, 
Now say with me, by your grace, I'm past caring. Have a seat for a moment. I want to point out two things. And um, we are in a season of volatility. Everything around us is shaking. We thought we were going to be in pretty good shape. It was a razor edge, uh, but we, we did have the Senate, those of us who believe in the we part. Um, but they have the Senate now. But he has the throne. And that's the best part. But in volatility, there's only one thing that can stabilize you, and that is the God who never changes. Now, here's what I love about God. He is infinitely the same, but he is incredibly unpredictable. You can depend upon him to be the same God, but you can't depend upon him to do the same thing. And that our confidence has to be in him. It's in the living God. And as I've looked at the scriptures and I've, I've seen what God has done over the, the ages, as God comes and he begins to move on his people, he begins to speak to them. And I, and I want you to listen to a passage of scripture as I read it to you. And I want to invite you to do something tonight just before we go beyond where we are. He says, You're familiar with this verse. He says, will a man rob God? It's a question. Will a man rob God? And I, I always say the answer is not if he's in his right mind. <laughs> he said, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? And he says, you're cursed with a curse for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed. All the nations will call you blessed. Would you say that? All the nations will call you. He says, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. As I looked at this passage one day, it was like the Lord said, you want to know what revival is? Here it is. I'm opening the windows of heaven. I'm pouring out a blessing, an overflowing blessing until there is no longer room to contain it. I'm going to stand against the devourer. He will not destroy your fruit and your ground. Your vine will not cast its grapes. You will not have an untimely birth. You will not have miscarriages. And then the nations will call you blessed. The nations will say to you, how can we get in on what you guys are doing? That is the neatest thing you're doing. Man, this is so cool. The nations will call you blessed. The nations will say, if you don't have a job, go to Brownsville. Everybody has a job at Brownsville, Pentecostal. Go to the church. If you have needs, they will call you blessed. You shall be a delightful land. When Moses came back off the mountain, he came back and he said, hey, gang, God gave me a plan. I want a $100 line here. I want a... $500 line here and I want a $1,000 line here. But you know what he did? He shared the plan. And he said, God's already given you the resources. Let's make it happen. And the most phenomenal thing took place. One of the guys came up to Moses and said, you need to make an announcement. He said, what kind of announcement? You need more purple stuff or more linen stuff? No, we got too much stuff. 
tell them not to bring any more. What you talking about? He said, no, just tell them. We, we have more stuff than we can handle. Tell them not to bring any more. Well, where'd they get it? Oh, just before they left Egypt, they walked up to the houses of the people who had been bombarded by the Holy Ghost, harassed out of their minds, softened up, made mellow, made willing. And they walked up to the door. Husbands probably sent their wives. They know me, honey, you go. Who is it? It's me, Mrs. Bin Hadi. What do you want? I need to talk to you. What do you want? Haven't you people done enough to us? Well, actually, we haven't. That's what I want to talk to you about. Why are you here? Well, you have some things that I need and some things that I want. And besides, we've worked for 400 years, and you owe us. Well, what do you want? Well, I, let's start with your earrings. I like that bracelet there. What do you have in the drawer over there? And the Bible says they ran sacked. They spoiled the Egyptians. And they came out with the wealth of the land. See, Egypt doesn't want you to worship. It would rather hold on to your stuff. Unless you go and knock on the door and say, I want my money, and I want it now. They have no reason to give it up to you. Now, you don't want it just because you have all these great ideas about what you're going to do with it. You want it because God's got a plan that he's going to lay on you when you get out in the wilderness, and that's to build a place where he can reside. you are going to have an ongoing sense of God's presence if we don't have an ongoing sense of lavishing him with our resources and blessing him and touching the nations as you've done. And the next level of glory has to do with generosity as well. You can't worship and be stingy. You can't worship and hold something back. And God doesn't need the poor so that you have to give your offering to the poor rather than worship him. He says, no. He says, you'll always have an opportunity to bless the poor. He says, right now, I'm the person you want to pour it out on. Let me tell you what we've been doing. Three months ago, we took a team of people to South Africa just for a regular conference, Pastor John. And when we walked into this place, um, one of the leaders said to me, he said, he said, Bishop, you need to understand that all kinds of people are gathered here. Almost every major tribal group was there. Every racial group was there. The East Indian, the Afrikaner, the English white, Asian people were there. Black Africans, the group called the colored, they were all there. And the Lord launched us into a ministry of reconciliation, unlike anything we'd ever been in before. And we just stood. Our, our minds were boggled at all the things that were taking place, at the stories that were, that were coming out, and the people whose lives were being touched. And as we were pouring in, as we were touching all of that, God was doing something in us. There was an awakening that was taking place. And there's something that the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth today, and he's saying to the church, you need to touch this. You need to invest in this. My church puts uh, a 403B plan together for me. And um, what they do is they take money out of my salary and they put it away. And... Uh, and they take it out so that the government won't take it. But I got my most recent statement and the, and the stocks had done all of this and, and I saw this minus $5,000 on this thing and I said, what is this? 
And uh, that's what had happened in the volatility of the stock market. And, and I said, God, what about this? And he says, well, that's kind of why I said, don't put money where thieves break through and moths and rust corrupts. He said, put it somewhere where they can't get to it. Now, you won't find any place, you won't find any real stockbroker ever saying to you, I guarantee you minimum 30% return on your investment. Only in the kingdom. 30, 60, 100 fold. And you can't get either 30, 60, or 100 fold without investing. Nobody stands over concrete and say, come on, corn. You have to go where you've sown the seed. Our ministry in South Africa has, has touched that nation. I'll share this one story with you, and I'm going to call you. Um, Pastor John has given me the privilege to ask you to share with us in this. And let me just tell you one story young man that I've been giving pastoral care to in South Africa who was what you would call a black racist. Got involved with my life, my books, my tapes of ministry, and God changed his heart. A few months ago, he went to an all-white church in an incredibly conservative section of South Africa. It was an incredibly conservative, charismatic all-white church. Das Führer. Um, when white folks see black folks coming to them in South Africa, they know they're going to get beaten up and told how bad they are, pretty much like white folks in America. And he said, I stood up and I said to them, look, people, I am not here to say to you how mean and how despicable you've been. I'm here to say to you, I need you to forgive me because when you came to this country, my forefathers had already polluted it with idolatry and spirit worship and blood sacrifices. And you came to a polluted land. And rather than thank you for bringing the gospel to us, we began to hate you and blamed you for what we created. He said, I'm just here to ask your forgiveness. He said, I'm sorry we've treated you this way. You were missionaries. You came with the gospel. And it changed our lives in many ways. And he said, while he was speaking, an elderly gentleman who had come in on crutches had thrown his crutches down and was walking down the aisle. He was an Afrikaner. I don't know if you know what that means, but he would be kind of like a right wing, close to skinhead in terms of his, his political persuasion. And he stood there healed, weeping. And he said, in all of my life, he said, I never thought I would live to see and hear a black man take responsibility for anything and ask forgiveness for anything. And he said, and how can I ask him? How can I allow him to do that and not do it myself? And he initiated, that farmer did, a stream of forgiveness and confession. He shared how he himself had had killed blacks who rebelled against him and buried him on his farm. And, and the stories that came out, and people began to, to come forward, and an incredible surge of the Spirit of God began to move through that place. And he said he stood there weeping, realizing that if he hadn't given up his own hatred, he wouldn't have been able to move in that dimension. South Africa is, is a wide open door. And they're particularly vulnerable because of the problem with with AIDS and HIV, it's about to explode there like an, like an atom bomb. And God's called us to invest in that place. Our most recent investment cost us almost $60,000 and God has been faithful. But I'd like for you to pray about initiating an outpouring of the Holy Spirit releasing revival, releasing the windows of heaven being opened on that nation. Would you pray with me?
Lord, Mary came to you with an exceedingly extravagant offering. It represented her love for you, her thanks, her appreciation. We want to come tonight and we want to bring something, as David would say, God forbid that I should offer him something that costs me nothing. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you help us to see that the mountain of the house of the Lord is being built and all nations are going to flow up to it? Spirit of God, would you brood over us for just a moment? creating in us faith and confidence to believe that you can touch the nations through us. Thank you for what you've accomplished tonight. Thank you for a new door, a new place, a new level of glory. And we open our hearts to you Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. I know the people in South Africa are going to thank us. I love the paraphrase of the scripture in Ephesians 6. It says, whatever good you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. I used to be really embarrassed about asking people for money until I realized that it wasn't for me and it wasn't for them. And that if you ever learn how to give, you won't ever have to worry about volatility with Dow Jones. Would you take your offering now and let's, let's be like Mary. Take something of value, take something that will cost you Take something that will place a demand upon God's resources because when you give it, he's going to have to do something about it. And say these words, Father, tonight, I believe that this offering is exactly what Paul said it was. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, and well-pleasing to God. Amen. We'd like to call you forward. If you will, stand, please. And we're going to ask you to bring your offering to the front. <clears throat> and uh, just a moment, we're going to be praying for everybody, those of you that want prayer. And uh, right now, though, we want everybody to stand and bring your offering to the front during the time Brother Lindell does some worship. Thank you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you all of my day. I want to raise the wonders of your mind. I want to sing with me my comfort. 